Between 1799 and 1843, there were three attempts to tunnel under London's River Thames. But only one was successful, and it would use an invention so simple yet genius that it would completely change how we build tunnels in our cities. Attempt number one saw the British engineer Ralph Dodd try to connect the bustling docks on either side of the river by tunnelling beneath it. His failed crazy idea would become an obsession for others. The second attempt was undertaken by a group of Cornish miners who dug almost 1,000 feet of a 1,200 foot tunnel. But they also failed when their pilot tunnel flooded for a second time, dampening spirits. Attempt number three would take 18 years to complete, go way over budget, flood twice, and provide us with one of the most important technological advances in tunneling, Mark Brunel's tunneling shield. Brunel's tunneling shield allowed workers to safely dig away the earth in front of them as the shield gave protection from any falling earth above until the tunnel could be lined with brick. The shield was in fact so revolutionary that it became a tourist attraction in itself, with contractors allowing pay members of the public the chance to venture underground and see the shield for themselves. And that money helped pay for the continued construction of the tunnel. So, on today's episode, we look at how tunnels went from novelty to necessity. We're in London to see how Ferrovial is still using an adaptation of Brunel's 190-year-old tunnelling shield to build the Northern Line extension, and to see how, with questionable health and safety, those first underground tunnels were built. Oh yeah, there is no way they'd be allowed to be built today. That's coming up next. Change here for Circle and District Lines. Exit here for Westminster Abbey and Houses of Parliament. Although Brunel had shown it was possible to dig beneath the Thames, it was expensive and time-consuming. They were only advancing 8 to 12 feet a week on that project. That's averaging half a metre a day. So, when the Great Western Railway saw an opportunity to build underground connections within the city for their passengers, they decided to go for a different method. Cut and cover. With cut and cover, the, the generally accepted view is you dig up the street, dig down to the level of the railway that you want, build a tunnel in it, fill the space around it and put the street back in and bingo, you've got a railway tunnel. That's Tony. Tony Ellis. He's written extensively about the London Underground in his book Building London's Underground and has also penned a number of other books about London's industrial history. They're all about London, mostly around the sort of social, industrial and engineering history of London. And he says that although cut and cover may sound simple at first... It's actually more complicated than that because most of the streets in London had sewers and utilities underneath them by that point. Even in the 1860s, there were gas pipes, there were water pipes and particularly sewers. Which complicated the building of the first underground, the Metropolitan Line that connected Paddington to Farringdon. The railway companies had to go and build the replacement sewers first, so they had to dig up both sides of the roads, often including the gardens of the houses that were there, propping up the houses so they didn't slide into these poorly supported workings, and none of the sort of propping that they had these days when they built these huge works. So they would have to dig those up, construct two new sewers, only then would they backfill and then dig up the middle of the street, rip out the old sewer, which was now disused, and construct the railway tunnel, and then backfill. So the work was taking far longer than most people actually thought. And this, as you can imagine, didn't go down too well with the public. The people who lived along the roads were continually complaining about the, the muck being walked into their houses, the interruption with the way of life. And a lot of the time, the tenants wouldn't even know that the work was going to take place, as it was the landlord who received the notification. And failed to pass the word on. They'd come back home from work and discover that their front garden was sliding into a pit that had been dug and that the only way to their front door was by balancing along some slippery mud-coated planks that the workmen had charitably left in, in place. And if outside the tunnel was a mess, then inside was a whole lot worse. It was dark, it was dangerous. So the, the people building it were navvies. So uh, the, the word comes from navigators because these are the people who originally built the canals, um, largely from the Irish community. They were big, strong men, they were expected to be able to shovel about 20 tonnes of earth per day. And health and safety was, let's say, not top of the list. Take for example the tunnel built between Euston Square and King's Cross. The tunnel there was actually tunnelled out to avoid breaking the road surface. It was a different contractor and they decided just to try and excavate out. And so to light the works, they just ran a metal pipe along the side of the tunnel as it was extended, punched holes through it and pumped gas in at one end and just lit the gas where it came out from the holes. And so you just had flames flaring out every so often. And that's what you had to work by. It was construction by flaming gas or candlelight. Neither a desirable option, really. But when the work was completed and the first trains made their first journeys, it didn't work fantastically well. 
The trains they were using were the same as the steam trains being used overground, but with a couple of modifications. They tried to make them so they would consume their own steam. So instead of the steam just being blown out into the atmosphere like a mainline train, the steam would be pumped into the water tanks, which were, were used to feed the firebox, or the feed, feed the, um, the, the locomotive, to try and condense the steam, which of course then warmed the water up and made the locomotive less efficient. There are even reports of drivers being advised to grow thick beards to help filter the steam before breathing it. Novel solutions were some of the only solutions. At Great Portland Street, there was a chemist who had a shop very close to the railway who used to sell something called Metropolitan Mixture, which was something he would dispense to customers who came in sort of coughing and choking from the atmosphere on the railway. Beards and medication were evidently not the solution, and subsequent extensions to the Metropolitan Line had as many openings as possible to allow the steam to escape. Take for example Leinster Gardens, a row of terraced houses the Metropolitan Line passes under. Numbers 23 and 24 were demolished to allow steam to escape from the trains travelling beneath. The facade of the building was rebuilt to match the rest of the terrace, but with fake windows and doors. Although the neighbours have fully functioning houses, 23 and 24 Leinster Gardens have only 5 foot of wall and the tracks immediately behind them. The Metropolitan Line was the first underground built in the world. It was built by private companies and privately funded, but each proposed line had to be approved by the government before being commissioned. And this way of working laid the perfect foundation for one handlebar moustached American financier and ex-convict to make his way to London in the early 1900s. And his contribution would lead to the modern underground as we know it. That's after this. As London experimented with underground tunnels, an American financier named Charles Yerkes was growing his fortune in the United States. It was a time of big business in the States, with railways extending across the country in a generation of businessmen that included Carnegie and Rockefeller amassing huge fortunes. Yerkes himself had set up his own bank by the time he was 28 and had accumulated a $1 million fortune by 35 only to then lose it all when the stock market collapsed in 1871, and he was found to have embezzled funds he was holding for the city of Philadelphia. The discovery of his financial dabbling earned him a two-year, four-month prison sentence, of which he served just seven months. When he was released, Yerkes then moved to Chicago, where he somehow rebuilt his fortune again, this time investing in transportation and Chicago's famous street trams. But his services were seen to be shoddy, and the people of Chicago began to revolt but there was one city still willing to take a bet on Yerkes, despite his checkered past. Yerkes was in New York at the time and was persuaded to come over to Britain and invest in the Underground Electric Railway Company. Yerkes' investment in the Underground Electric Railway Company didn't give him a fully functioning railway. He had essentially purchased the rights to build one. To build the Bakerloo Tube, the Great Northern Piccadilly and Brompton, which became the Piccadilly Line, and the Charing Cross Houston and Hampstead, which became the Charing Cross branch of the Northern Line. He would also buy the already established District Line, where he would invest in its electrification and which would put him in control of four lines of the London Underground. One of the quirks of the London Underground at the time was that it wasn't a unified system. Each line was effectively promoted separately by different companies and built individually, and that explains why, why we have weird lack of interchanges at various places. Like the, the Northern Line Charing Cross branch doesn't have any kind of interchange near Euston Square with the Metropolitan Line. Companies just didn't coordinate the construction very well. And this is why Charles Yerkes' involvement in London becomes a turning point for the city's underground network. He came up with this whole concept together with his architect, Leslie Green, to create a unified system. And six years after having created that, he then started buying up the other independent lines, which effectively led to the creation of the modern underground as we know it. He designed a network of lines with common ticketing practices between them, gave each station its own unique tiling design, electrified the district line, his own lines, and... As part of that, he built uh, the underground's own power station down at Chelsea, which closed over 10 years ago. And that was the largest power station in the world at the time. Um, absolutely vast building, which was then extended and extended over the course of the 20th century to provide more and more power for the underground. The electrification and unification of the lines helped Londoners move around even better than before. But there were still some teething problems when electrification was first introduced. If you bought a property at the time, you owned all the land below and above it, meaning anyone trying to dig a tunnel beneath your house had to pay you. 
they had the right to demand you paid them for the property. You had to buy the property in its entirety. To keep costs down, many underground lines follow the curvature of the public roads above. Take Swan Lane, for example, a very narrow street where the two underground tunnels had to be built above each other, as opposed to side by side. Something called rolling the tunnels. They had a generating station down in Southwark. This was the far end of the line from there, so you already had a voltage drop. The trains would be coming along, and there were these diminutive little electric trains. The tunnels are only eight feet, sorry, 10 feet 2 in diameter. The trains look like two upright pianos, bolted back to back really primitive for the driver on the train. There's no protection from the electricity or anything. They just have a great big handle they can use to control the power at full line voltage. That's 550 volts going straight into the motor under their feet. So it's going up, swinging up a 1 in 14 hill, which is a horrifically steep gradient for a train, and then curving 90 degrees into the terminus station. As you can imagine, the train struggled. And these were the first electric trains running in Britain. They would come out of the station at Borough, and they would basically accelerate hard to try and get up the hill. And if they had a fully laden train, so that's three carriages full of people, sometimes the lights would dim to a dull red glow because the power was just being taken by the motor and couldn't power the lighting in the carriages. And occasionally the trains wouldn't make it up the hill, they would stall part of the way up, at which point the driver would then have to take the brakes off, roll it backwards to the bottom of the hill and have another run up. And sometimes they'd have to unclip, un- uncouple the locomotive from the following train, put it on the back, and the two locomotives would try and get the train up to the station, at which point the second locomotive would then have to uncouple again, whiz back wrong line to its carriages waiting in the previous station and then try and haul them up. The modern underground still runs on electricity powered by the national grid. And if you've ever wondered why the lights flicker when you travel on the underground, well... In order to ensure that an electrical fault can't affect too large an area on the underground, it's broken into various sections, and between those sections you get gaps in the conductor rails. So a train can go along and get over them, it can coast over those gaps, but that can cause flickering of the lights as it goes over and switches from one section to another. We got our safety gear on and took a trip to Battersea to get a closer look at the work that the Ferrovia Lagraman and Langerwerk joint venture is doing to extend the Northern Line. We have bigger and that's where we met Elena Diaz. She was the rail section engineer on the project when we visited and gave us a tour of the site. Yeah, we are going to access through there. You see the stairs down into the tunnel and then we can walk along the platform. How far down do we, do we go? How deep is it? From the inside of the train car, it's hard to see how the tunnels were built. But from those early beginnings, with the navvies to now, construction methods have always been improving. The finish is the same, the finished product, but the ways we build things, as I was saying, keep improving, and maybe using better materials and all that. We chatted in the old control room of the tunnel boring machine, or TBM as it's often called. So there was an engineer here 24 hours checking the same parameters that the driver was checking down at the bottom inside the machine. Elaine is originally from Spain, and since moving to London, she's worked on the Crossrail project, Northern Line Extension and Thames Tideway Tunnel. We met her on the side of the new Battersea station. As you probably know, we have built in the Northern Line Extension, so we finished here, it was 3.2 kilometers tunnel. At the moment we have completed all tunnels and they are building the station. We asked what the improvements have been, not just since the original tunnels were built, but even those from the 70s. I started working in Tunnel five years ago, so there are always bits and bits that keep changing and the technology keep advancing. Like here in the Northern Line, we use a, a pressure balance a tunnel boring machine. Uh, the pressure balance tunnel boring machine is important as it controls the settlement so as not to affect buildings above. The way the APB machine works, like it keeps like trying to create a paste on, from the ground, so it's easy to compensate the pressures that you have inside your chamber with the pressure that you have outside. And this paste, known as bentonite, was actually a British invention from the 70s, which was created during the construction of the Victoria Line. As with so many sort of items of interesting technology, Britain was leading the way and developed something called the bentonite tunnelling shield, which used a, a bentonite mixture, which is a thick thixiotropic clay, which means that um, it can hold its, hold its shape when it's not being moved. If you're moving it, it turns really runny, but when you're not moving it, it thickens, and so it can support the tunnelling face. There are many intricacies to the tunnel boring machine, but to put it simply, the tunnel boring machine is like a mini factory, with everything needed to dig and build the tunnel, as well as keep the workers below ground comfortable. It is a factory. They are you know, 
100 metres long plus. They weigh close on 1,000 tonnes. The TBM has a rotating cutter head at the front, which is pushed against the earth by hydraulic cylinders. The excavated earth is then moved into the back part of the machine, first via a screw conveyor, and then a traditional conveyor belt. Once the cutting is complete, the blades and screw conveyor stop, and it's time to build the rings, which are pre-built reinforced concrete segments that together make up the complete circular ring. The rings are lifted into place using a vacuum, and the hydraulic cylinders that were pushing against the last set of rings are temporarily retracted to place each section of the new ring in place. The segments are then bolted into position, the keystone inserted at the top, and the hydraulic cylinders push against the newly formed ring to secure their position and help move the tunnel boring machine forward. And of course, there's a modern version of Brunel's tunneling shield to protect anybody or thing from falling earth as the construction takes place. The tunnel boring machine used is dependent on the earth being tunneled through. Waterlogged ground like that under the River Thames needs a TBM with bentonite, and other ground can use the traditional TBM. So if Brunel was advancing half a meter a day in the mid-1800s, how fast can we tunnel with all these improvements? The rings that we had here were 1.5 meters LM rings, and as an average we were completing 15 or 16 per day. Oh wow, so that's yeah. very fast. Yeah, yeah, it's quite that's fast. That's way faster than yeah. I thought. And here in this uh, tunnel we faced like, a lot of obstructions, as I was saying, but in previously in Croatia I think the average was even higher. This is actually a, a, an example of, of a clash detection. That's Joachim. Joachim, sure. He was a digital engineer on the Northern Line Extension when we visited. Uh, what that means is I'm responsible for the information and the 3D models on site. He worked with the clash detection system that's used by each department on the project. And it's a pretty useful tool. The Northern Line Extension has so many departments that a system like this is needed to avoid design inconsistencies. These inconsistencies are known as clashes. He runs the digital models through the clash detection software. And if it does occur that there's a clash, which it often does, uh, we get those two departments into a room and we discuss how to solve it. Um, so for us here, we have our architectural model in that top right hand window, set A, and we're comparing the geometry of that model to the geometry of the void model, uh, which is set B. His work means that if there are problems in the design, they can be addressed before any holes are drilled, tunnels bored, or work undertaken. It keeps the design consistent. You can't predict everything that could go wrong. Uh, the whole point of using these 3D virtual models is that you try and diminish that risk. The digital models also serve another purpose. Remember how when those original tunnels were being built, the public didn't really know much of what was going on? Well, that's all changed now too. We have these things called community engagement sessions uh, with the communications team on site, where we talk to the community around Battersea and Nine Ohms and Kenningtons. And for those, we often do these kind of walk-arounds and overview images of what, what we plan the finished product is going to be like, so that the community knows and can tell, all right, well, that's what I'm going to get. Projects like these are an enormous undertaking and require huge amounts of skill, knowledge and perseverance. But there's always one thing Joachim, Elena and all those involved in the project have in common. It makes you really proud. And even in the future when I come here, I may be going to the train here, I say that, ah, I did this. <laughs> A big thanks to Elena Diaz, Joachim Schur and Tony Bazielis for their insights on all things London Underground. And to Alakna Nanthakopan, Laura Brown and all the Ferrovia Lagraman team for their work behind the scenes. I'm Craig Lawless. And I'm Nicholas Hewson.